what I had no inkling of and had didn't even know about was a book um, written the third, the third Source, and this was a book called, well, it was a book originally called Kol Kore, a voice crying out in the wilderness, which is really interesting. Um, the voice crying out, it's the phrase obviously from Isaiah, and it's quoted in the New Testament. You weren't going to have this source. You got an email from someone. And then I got an email, and I want to read this email. So this book, Kol Kore, was written by a rabbi in the 19th century. I'd never heard of this book. Um, and I get this email. And um, so this was after we'd already discussed uh, doing the... Um, uh, uh, quarantine. We were discussing it. We were talking about it. Okay, we were talking about possibly doing something on Matthew. And somebody wrote to me. His name is Yosef. And he says, heard you were going to discuss the Gospels. I found an interesting commentary from a rabbi in the 1800s who had a similar idea. And he was very much into creating a dialogue between the Christian and the Jew through comparative study of oral traditions, the Tanakh, and the things found in the New Testament. In his opinion, they were perfectly compatible rather than juxtaposed. Mm -hmm. You may be interested in his transcript. He writes, I'm an Orthodox Jew, and I found it a fascinating read. And he gives me the name of this book. And he writes, anyway, I'm a proud support team member, and I uh, appreciate you, a seeker and lover of Torah. I hope you do a show on this rabbi. I actually learned something from him. And this gentleman, this Orthodox Jew, is a member of the support team, which I think is pretty cool. So he tells me about this book, and the English translation is the Bible, the Talmud, and the New Testament. But the original name is Kol Kore, a voice calling out, and then you can put in brackets, in the wilderness. And it's written by a rabbi named Elijah Tzvi Soloveitchik. <laughs> And I hear that name, and I'm like, Soloveitchik? I know that name. So I immediately go on to Amazon, order the book. It arrived a few days ago, and I call you up with my mouth dropped. Before so, you say what you, what you called me about. Yeah. This is a, can I say, um, from a source that you would not expect to be talking about. In fact, it's my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. That he was the first or one of the first? He is the first Jew ever to write a commentary on the New Testament. So, so stop, just for a second, guys. Now, yeah. just I want everyone at Shavuot, okay? Yeah. We're here doing the Hebrew Gospel of Matthew. We've got our sources. We were at our meeting together. Don't know how many. I forgot about the meeting. We were in Jerusalem. We've got Dalich. We've got the Hebrew Gospel. we got the 28 manuscripts. And then, just recently, the third source comes from a man who is writing about the connection between the Bible, the Tanakh, the Talmud, and the New Testament. As yeah. somebody say, things stopped. <laughs> Everything stopped. And, and no, so it's incredible here. So in the introduction, they're explaining, uh, the, these uh, scholars are explaining, he's the first uh, Jew to write a commentary on the New Testament. Mm -hmm. and, and they explain, there are Jews who wrote about the New Testament before that, but they were Jews who were in debates and as part of the debates, they were saying, we could use this argument, we could use that argument. They weren't trying to understand the New Testament in and of itself. They were criticizing the New Testament. And here's a rabbi who comes along and he's actually saying, no, I want to understand what this book means. Yes. So this rabbi, Eliyahu Tzvi Soloveitchik, he was born in 1805 and died in 1881 mm -hmm. um, at the age of around 75 or 76. And I opened this up and I was confirmed in the first few pages is what I suspected because I know the name Soloveitchik. Soloveitchik, that's a family of famous rabbis who are cousins of my family. And I wasn't sure, is this the same Soloveitchik? I open up the book and I see, yes, this man is my cousin. You called me and you said, Keith, everything changes. <laughs> so... So he's my cousin, and um, in fact, I can tell you exactly how he's my cousin. So there's a website, genie.com, and I go there, and my genealogy, uh, I put that in there a few years ago. I, I, I found like death certificates and uh, birth certificates and all kinds of documents from and tax records from Russia, and so I was able to trace my uh, uh, lineage in there. And, and it's interesting, we're talking about tracing lineage. One of the questions that was asked... But I was discussing with T-Bone this whole section of Matthew 1, 1 through 17, and he asked a question I didn't think about much. He said, where'd they get this information? Where did they, where did they get? You know, fine, up until Salathiel, Sal I can't say the word, Shaltiel, Salathiel, if I'm not pronouncing that correct in English, up until Salathiel, those are all names that appear in the Tanakh. Yeah. 
right? Matthew is not telling us any name we can't find in the Tanakh up until Salathiel. The names that appear after that don't appear anywhere in the Tanakh. They don't appear in any other Jewish sources. They don't appear in the Talmud. Where did Matthew get them? And here we are. And I thought, okay, well, a few years ago I went and I dug through tax records and I found birth certificates and death certificates and I found the community ledger written by the rabbi in 1846 from my great, great, uh, um, let's see, he's my uh, uh, second great grandfather, Rabbi Baruch Nassan al So these documents will, ex I mean, imagine this, we're in 2020 and the document still exists after the Holocaust and the burning of Eastern Europe. The document from 1846 still exists with the handwriting of the rabbi, and I was able to order a photograph of it from the National Archives of Lithuania. So what we're doing today, they could have done in, in, you know, in the time of Yeshua, so, so, meaning so, 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 so documents me, existed at the time. So as, as we're asking the question, and the genie, we're still in Matthew chapter 1, folks. Believe us, we're still in Matthew chapter 1. I think we're still on verse 1. So, the three sources we're going to use as we go through this study, uh, Dalich, uh, the annotated Jewish uh, New Testament, and then this particular book by Nehemiah's cousin. <laughs> and so specifically, he's my second cousin five times removed. Five times removed. So I was able to look up on genie.com and it shows you how, because I don't know how to calculate those times removed and stuff can like I, that. He's my second cousin. <laughs> can I, can, please everyone, if, if you would just understand the significance of this and why it was so significant to me, specifically for Shavuot, um, I did something, Nehemiah, a, a, few, a, few, a few days ago. Once I actually ordered the book too. We both read the beginning of the book. We didn't even, I didn't even get to the issue of commentary of it, the one, one through 16, uh, uh, step 16. But he says some things that really caught both of our attentions. And you called me with one of them. Can you read that? I mean, it's, uh, before we get to that, I, I want to I just explain to people how radical this was. In eight, I think he wrote this around 1878, or he published a first draft around 1878. How radical this was for an ultra ortho I'm a Karite Jew. Right? For many Jews, I'm a heretic to begin with. You know, For an ultra-Orthodox Jew to write a commentary on the New Testament, and it's not a criticism of how horrible the New Testament is. It's saying, what is the New Testament trying to say? That was, ex honestly, what he did in some ways is more radical than what I'm doing. Um, and by the way, the fourth most obvious source we have, which is zero, right? It's, it's like before the first, second, and third source is the Gospel of Matthew and Hebrew itself with the manuscripts, right? Yeah. Um, but this, so you call this the fourth source. Um, so what he did was so radical because he was an ultra-Orthodox Jew. He was not a Jewish convert to Christianity. There were Jews who converted to Christianity who wrote commentaries. Mm -hmm. He's the first Jew who remained a Jew, um, and in fact, an ultra-Orthodox Jew, writing a commentary, and let me read you something that he said, which just blew me away. Yeah. Um, and I want to, before I get to that, just to give an idea of who this Soloveitchik is, um, the founder of modern Orthodox Judaism in America is a rabbi named Rabbi Yosef Dov Soloveitchik. American Orthodox Jews refer to him as the Rav, which means the rabbi. Right? If you say the Rav and you don't say who you're talking about in American Judaism, you mean the great-great-great-nephew, uh, uh, I don't know how many greats, of the man who wrote the, um, this commentary on the New Testament. Right? Eli Eliyahu Tzvit Soloveitchik was the brother of the ancestor of the Rav. I mean, that's, whoa, that's a big deal in itself. The brother of the Rav uh, lived around the, the corner from where I grew up and... I used, my father used to take me over to his house on Shabbat, and my father's best friend was the nephew of the Rav, the son of the man that we used to visit. And the synagogue we used to go to, that I used to go to growing up, was Moshe Soloveitchik's shul. It was, it was the synagogue where the rabbi was the um, essentially like a great, 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 great nephew of this rabbi who wrote the commentary on the New Testament. Now, in the introduction to the book, anybody can buy this on Amazon, it's called the Bible, the Talmud, and the New Testament. In the introduction, the scholar who translates it, he explains that, that um, another scholar went and asked a family member, right? Because it's a very prominent family. Mm -hmm. And they asked him about different members of the family. Oh, we have a family story about Rav Chaim Brisker. We have a family story about Rav Yosef Dov. We have a family about the Beis Halevi, right? They have, they have stories that go on generation after generation about the, uh, these different famous rabbis. And then they ask him about Rebbe Eliyahu Tzvi 
Salavechik, who wrote the commentary on the New Testament. And what's the, what were they told? We don't talk about him. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to read to you what Rabbi Yosef, or sorry, Rabbi Eli, Eliyahu Tzvi, Elijah Tzvi Salavechik, writes in the introduction to his... Keith, if we do nothing else, if we don't even touch a single Hebrew Matthew manuscript, if we do nothing else but go through and discuss the comments of Rabbi Leo Tzvi Soloveitchik, I think this will be an extremely important series, something that's never been done. A Jew and a Christian are coming together to discuss what the first Jewish commentary on the New Testament uh, talked about. Do you know why I didn't know about this book, uh, Keith? Um... I guess you could say I, I was ignorant of it, right? I've said there's libraries full of books I don't know about. But in fact, this book only came out in 2019. It was published originally like around 1878, 1879. Uh, as far as I know, there's one copy in Hebrew at the National Library of Israel, which I haven't seen yet. I'm trying to get a hold of it, but the library's closed. Um, hopefully it'll open up very soon and, and I'll get a, a scan of that. Um, and the only thing that survived other than that, and there might be one copy in, in Paris as well, uh, is the French translation. So it wasn't translated into English, uh, and it still isn't available in Hebrew, as far as I can tell. Um, at least not anywhere. I, you know, there's a, there's a website called HebrewBooks.org. They purport to have every book written by rabbis, um, or they're trying to have every book written by rabbis uh, that was ever printed. Not manuscripts, but printed books. And this book, surprisingly, is not there. Um, so it wasn't until last year that the English translation was available and the Hebrew original is still not available to me, at least. Hopefully it will be soon. All right. So this is what Rabbi Eliyahu Tzvi Soloveitchik wrote in 1879 in the introduction to the first Hebrew edition. And I have to say, I got a little bit emotional when I read this. This is my second cousin, five times removed, writing the first Jewish commentary from a Jew who didn't convert to Christianity on the New Testament. He says, I know that I will not escape from the criticism of both sides, Jews and Christians. My Hebrew brethren will say, what happened to Rev Eliyahu? Yesterday he was one of us, and today he was filled with a new spirit. New said sarcastically. And my Christian brethren will say, this one who is a Jew comes to reveal to us the secrets of the Gospels? How can we accept that he speaks correctly and a true spirit dwells within him? He says these two extremes are really saying one thing, that it is it cannot be that what he is speaking with his mouth is what he believes in his heart. On this criticism, my soul weeps uncontrollably. Only God knows, and God is my witness, that in this I am free of sin. Keith, these are words that I've prayed in my heart on many occasion, because I have the Christians out there, some of the, the Hebrew roots folks who say, Nehemiah is a secret missionary. His goal is to convert us to Judaism. And I have the Christians out there, some of them, Hebrew roots people as well. Nehemiah is the Antichrist Jew. I mean, my second cousin, I guess it runs in the family. Um, and, and the fact that today they talk about all the rabbis in their lineage, but they don't talk about him. He's the one, he's, you know, he's the, uh, the black sheep of the family. Well, can I can I also read something from this book that was inspiring to me? Yes. Uh, at the end of his introduction, he reads this. He says this. He's actually talking about how he's being attacked from both sides. Yeah. He says, "May I succeed in this venture? May the favor of Yud Hey Vav Hey he puts the Y H W H descend upon my work so that it may produce in the hearts of those who read it abundant and beneficial fruits, that with a unanimous spirit they will embrace the worship of one God." And that through my humble intervention, the words of the prophet, and I love the verse because you and I talked about it many times as we traveled the world, that the words of the prophet will come true. Zephaniah 3.9. Mm. Then I will make the peoples pure of speech yes. so that they all will invoke yud heh vav -Hey by name and serve him with one accord wow. or shoulder to shoulder or one shoulder.